Okay, uh, why don't we get started? Uh, well, welcome back to the second week of the program. I trust you all had a good weekend. Uh, trips to New York, canoeing, even skydiving I saw was perhaps being planned. It's uh, lots of choices. Uh, I can assure you that the weather doesn't get any better in New Jersey in the summertime than what it was over the weekend. Uh, we're not usually that lucky, so that worked out extremely well. Uh, and I hope you all took advantage of it. But now it's back to reality again, 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, and we're back to uh, lectures on grid-based methods for hydrodynamics, MHD, and radiation hydrodynamics. So uh, this is the third of my four lectures, and today I wanted to describe uh, how Godinoff methods work, or what I'll call PPM-like methods. PPM is sort of the poster child of, Go of Godinoff methods used in astrophysics. And my last lecture on Wednesday, I'll be talking about extensions to these methods, both operator split methods and Godinoff methods for additional physics, uh, microphysics and special relativity. And in particular, uh, I'll spend most of the lecture talking about extensions to radiation hydrodynamics, which is really a whole new ball game. You sort of have to start again when you start doing radiation hydrodynamical problems with these kinds of methods. So today, though, I just wanted to talk about the Godinoff method. Uh, and its elements, uh, including Riemann solvers, the reconstruction algorithm, uh, and unsplit integrators, which are necessary for MHD. Uh, I'll talk about implementation, and I'll use the Athena code as an example, although there are many such codes, and you could use any one of them as an example. The one I'm familiar with is Athena, so I'll talk about implementation issues in Athena. I'll show you some results from tests, and I'll say a few words about comparing grid codes to SPH methods. Uh, and I'll also talk about Galilean invariants of grid code, since that's a topic of, of recent interest. Okay, so I left you last Thursday with this plot here. We had written down the uh, finite volume difference equations for the cell-centered volume average values, U, that includes momentum, mass, uh, total energy, magnetic field is at cell faces, and we also wrote down the finite area discretizations of the induction equation using area averaged components of the magnetic field. And they're evolved using fluxes that are at cell faces. Those are the area and time averaged fluxes at cell faces. And the magnetic field is evolved using uh, line and time averaged electric fields at cell corners. And you can ensure exact conservation by sharing the fluxes and electric fields across the entire mesh. And I left you with this burning question, how to compute these fluxes? I'm sure you've been dying to know for three days, so finally, let's talk about how you do that. Well, let's talk about Godinov's original first order method. Uh, we're losing a little bit on the edge there, if it's possible to move the screen over a little bit. Uh, anyways, it's not important. Uh, basically, Remember that the, uh, there we go, I'll wait, I'll wait, good. The, remember the finite, the finite uh, volume, uh, volume average values in, in one dimension with a piecewise constant values, so first order values, you can sort of represent them as a histogram of values along the x-axis. And then you may imagine, what if I, tr if I imagine this was the actual distribution of the fluid in the problem? Then there are discontinuities at the cell edges uh, and those define Riemann problems. Riemann problems are the evolution of an initially discontinuous state. And so each cell interface defines a Riemann problem because the fluid has discontinuous properties there. And the solution of the Riemann problem is the evolution of various waves. They may be linear, they may be nonlinear, there may be shocks, there may be rarefactions, there may be contacts. It all depends on what those two states are. But schematically, these jumps these, all these Riemann problems would evolve into these different uh, structures as you see here. So as time evolves, it'd go from this to this. And if you were to average the solution you know, of this Riemann problem over the cell, that would give you the time evolution of the uh, volume average values in that cell. And you could continue to evolve the system forward in time in this way until waves launched from one interface crossed the entire cell and began to interact with the other interface. At that point, the Riemann problem at this interface is no longer independent of all the rest. It's being affected by its neighboring cell interfaces, and so you have to stop. And so you can evolve this for a time step, which is delta x over v plus c, the wave speed across the cell, which is just the CFL condition in another form again. 
And so you can take a time step that satisfies this criteria and evolve it forward in time uh, using these Riemann, uh, solutions to these Riemann problems to give the time evolution of volume average values. But gosh, that seems like a tremendous amount of work to calculate the structure of all these Riemann fans and shocks and then do the integral under the curve to calculate what this volume average solution is inside each cell. Well, I think one of Godinov's great realizations was that you don't need to do that actually uh, because conservation means that you only really need to know what the solution is at the cell interface itself so that you can compute the flux through that interface. And then conservation says that the integrated value within the cell has to just be the uh, difference of the fluxes through the faces of the cell. Conservation guarantees that I only need to know what the fluxes are at the cell edges. So in particular, this little Riemann problem here can be blown up in a space-time diagram. This is space and time in this direction here. Initially, it was a discontinuity. And as time goes by, it launches a shock wave and a contact discontinuity and a rarefaction fan. So that's that, uh, you know, this, that's the structure right here. But I really only need to know what the solution is along x equals zero, along the dashed line, because if I know this state right here, I can calculate the flux, rho vx for uh, mass, rho vx uh, squared for momentum, and so on. Uh, and then I can, I can update the cell averaged values just using the, using the conservation laws. I know the flux of this face and I can update it. So <clears throat> what you're using a Riemann solver for is to calculate the state at the interface, the time average state at the interface. If you know the time average state at the interface, you can then calculate the time average fluxes and then you can integrate the solution forward in time using the conservation laws. And that's the basic concept of how the Godinov scheme works and, and how it uses Riemann solvers to compute the fluxes. So some more words about these Riemann solvers. You can develop exact and fairly efficient nonlinear Riemann solvers for ideal gases and just pure hydrodynamics. In MHD, that's much more difficult because as we saw in the first lecture, there are three wave families in MHD. That gives you seven characteristics, six possible intermediate states. Uh, and some circumstances, two of these three ways can be degenerate. So there aren't always six independent uh, intermediate state. Sometimes there's only four or five or some intermediate number depending on whether or not the problem's degenerate or whether the characteristics are degenerate. And so, as we said before, mathematically the equations of MHD are not strictly hyperbolic. They don't always have linearly independent eigenvalues. And so in practice, MHD Godinov schemes use approximate or linearized Riemann solvers instead of exact nonlinear solvers, which in general are too expensive for, for a practical use. And there are many different approximate solvers available. The most popular include Rho's method. It keeps all seven characteristics, but it treats each as a simple wave, that is, as a discontinuity. So you have uh, rarefaction shocks in the flow. Obviously, that's unphysical. But remember, we don't need the Riemann solver to return the exact profile of the solution. We're only using it to get the intermediate state at the interface. And Rho's method will actually give you the exact solution for an isolated shock wave uh, at the intermediate state, uh, even though it's representing things like uh, rarefactions as discontinuities. So it's got good resolution of all ways. The green is a good point, the red is a bad point. It's expensive because it requires this uh, characteristic decomposition. It's difficult to add new physics. You've got to do the linearization all over again. And it, it fails for strong rarefactions, for strongly nonlinear problems. This Rose method will give you negative densities and pressures in the intermediate states. Uh, which is not going to be good. There's also a whole family of methods uh, based on HLL type solvers. A not popular one is the HLLE method. It only keeps the largest and smallest wave speeds. It has only one intermediate state in between. Uh, it's very, very simple and efficient. You can show in one dimension, not in multi dimensions, but in one dimension it guarantees positivity. But it's very, very diffusive, especially for contacts. So much better are the extensions of HLL to uh, HLLC and HLLD, HLLC for hydro, HLLD for MHD. They add the entropy wave, the contact discontinuity, and the HLLD puts the alphane waves back into the solution, and ha they have more than one intermediate state. They're, and they're, they're sort of workhorse methods. They're pretty good in terms of accuracy, and they're very, very efficient. And uh, just to, you know, <clears throat> show show pictorially or, or graphically what the differences are. So here's the effect of various approximations to a Riemann problem. This is the one I showed you before. These are all space-time plots. 
Here's spatial position, time along the vertical axis. Here's the interface, two discontinuous states at time equals zero. This particular uh, inter, uh, Riemann problem sets off a rarefaction to the left and a shock to the right and a contact. If you were to use Rho's approximate solver, that's what the solution would look like. It would replace the rarefaction with the rarefaction shock, uh, and the contact and the, and the shock wave would still be there. Uh, this solution is obviously not the same as that one, but what's important is the solution along the dotted line is exactly the same. And so the flux that the row solver returns for you, that is the solution along the interface, is exactly the same as what you would have gotten for an exact solver, uh, but much, much more uh, cheaply. So it's a better, better to use in a Godneff method. And finally, you can use things like the HLLE, which throws away this contact and just returns one intermediate state. And once again, the solution along the dashed line is a reasonable approximation for the actual uh, you know, analytic solution, so it, it works reasonably well. Which one uh, works the best? Well, it depends on your application, and you sort of have to explore the application, uh, explore the use of each one of these different solvers. And I think there's more progress in the development of solvers for MHD. We'll see new ones come along as time goes by. Well, so we've described a first order Godnov method. It's this original scheme, but that actually results in a very diffusive algorithm. Uh, as you've seen, the first order upwind uh, uh, method for advection of a pulse was very diffusive. And similarly, if you apply Godnov's methods to real hydro problems, you'll find it's very, very diffusive. How do we do better? Well, we saw how to do better last time. But basically, we use higher order reconstruction to compute the left and right states to give us a better approximation for the uh, spatial distribution of the quantities within a cell. We can use piecewise linear reconstruction, resulting in something called muscle, although there are different choices. Muscle is one particular kind of piecewise linear reconstruction. Or we can use piecewise parabolic, as we saw last time as well. That leads to the PPM method. So uh, the combination of piecewise parabolic reconstruction with a Riemann solver gives you this piecewise parabolic method that's so popular. So, uh, Here's a picture so I took from my last lecture, which kind of shows what's going on here. Again, here's a one-dimensional distribution of volume averaged values shown as sort of histograms. The dots represent the volume average value contained within the cells. And we, by using the muscle method, the piecewise linear reconstruction, we calculate what the distribution of the quantity is within the cell uh, using a linear approximation. And the, and the um, extrapolation of that to the cell edge defines the left and right states that we would use then for the Riemann problem. Rather than using the cell edge values here and here as in a first order Godnoff method, we use these left and right states returned by this linear uh, reconstruction. And this reconstruction has to satisfy certain constraints to keep the construction monotonic and prevent the uh, introduction of new extrema to make it so-called TVD, or total variation diminishing. And I'm not going through the details of all those monotonicity constraints. There's choices that you can make. There's different kinds of limiters, slope limiters. But here's one that's produced this kind of reconstruction. And it's those limiters that give you these discontinuous values at the left and right states. If you really had smooth flow, if, this, if these cell-centered values were just increasing linearly, this piecewise linear reconstruction would be exact. And there would be no difference between the left and right states. And the Riemann solver would return for you, uh, you know, just simple ways uh, from, from those two. There would be no discontinuity there. It would just, you know, linear ways from the solution to the Riemann problem. So that's to say that for smooth flow, the difference between the left and right states is small. But for shocks where you have discontinuities in these volume average values, the left and right states uh, have a large difference. And the Riemann solver will automatically gives you the appropriate dis dissipation you need. It returns for you a flux of energy in which uh, contains the appropriate amount of dissipation to turn that kinetic energy into uh, thermal energy. It's basically giving for you the analytic solution for shock fronts and for you know, nonlinear waves in your, in your equations. And so you don't need any artificial viscosity because the, the dissipation is built in to the solution of the Riemann problem. Exactly. You're getting the exact analytic solution, uh, well, at least if you're using the exact solver, or are you getting a good approximation to the analytic solution if you're using an approximate solver? And that's all you need to get the right answer in, in the volume average values. So no artificial viscosity is ever needed for these methods. And unless, uh, 
we'll see in a minute that in multi-dimensions, then it's, it's beneficial to add a little bit of dissipation in some circumstances. Sorry, the dissipation depends on the reconstruction? Usually the amount of dissipation you need depends on the reconstruction because the reconstruction is adding dissipation to the solution. For example, if you're doing piecewise constant first order, you're adding a lot of dissipation. And if you're using second order, you're adding less and third order less. And so the amount of extra dissipation you need uh, depends on what reconstruction you're using. The, the viscosity you need for Godinoff methods is entirely different than what you need for uh, multi-step methods. You don't need it to capture shocks. You don't need viscosity to produce entropy in shocks. What you need it for is to reduce ringing uh, in some circumstances. Okay. Uh, well, there are more details here, uh, and I'll try to give you a flavor without going into the, to the guts of it, but it turns out that a time advance of the left and right states are required uh, um, and for MHD, that, how that's done is described in a paper uh, in JCP in 2005. Why do you need a time advance? Well, you don't need it if you're in first order, but if you're at second and higher order, then the solution to the Riemann problem needs to account for the fact that it's not just this little value right at the edge of the cell which interacts with the rest of the cell, it's some average of this function here over the distance that a wave will travel in delta t. This entire region of this cell is interacting with this, this entire region of this cell. And so you need to somehow account for the fact that it's not just a point-wise value here you need to take, but rather a, a section of the solution that you need to take. And so this time advance does that for you. It, it, it uh, updates the solution in those underneath the piecewise linear functions to compute the appropriate time average state that's going to interact with its neighboring time average state in the corresponding next cell that the Riemann solver will use to return the, the fluxes. And so uh, how, do it, how does that work? Well, the, the original PPM paper used characteristic tracing to, to uh, do this time advance. That is to say, W hat, the, the solution at the left and right states for the uh, primitive variables here, uh, so at i plus a half is one cell value, i minus a half is the other corresponding cell, cell edge value. Those primitive values returned by the piecewise reconstruction is advanced by this, this time advance here, which, uh, which looks messy but comes from a linearization of the equations. If you assume the Jacobian uh, DFDU is constant, uh, then the quantities here, lambda, are just the eigenvalues of that, the, of that uh, Jacobian, and L and R are vectors of the left and right eigenvectors, sorry, matrices of the left and right eigenvectors of that linearized system of a constant Jacobian DFDU. So this is a, a characteristic tracing step which, which evolves the left and right states in time appropriately. It's essentially a directionally split time advance in the x, y, and z directions independently. And so you need to add source terms for MHD. Because remember, the longitudinal component of the field uh, in one dimension, bx in the x direction, would not evolve uh, without those source terms. But that means that you can't con keep div b equals zero during the time advance if you don't advance bx. And so you have to add source terms. So the bx evolves according to a dby dy term, and by evolves according to a dbx dx term. Of course, in 1D, these terms would be zero because dbx dx is zero in 1D. But in multi-dimensions, these terms are not zero. And so for multi-dimensional MHD reconstruction, you have to add in these source terms. And it's quite simple to show that without these terms, your method won't be second order convergent. And so they're very critical here. Now, this is one way to achieve time evolution, but there are others. For example, you can use multi-step methods. This results in a single step method where you just calculate the left and right states, you time advance them, you compute a flux and away you go. But you can also use multi-step methods like runge kutta methods where you take several time steps to get the full step forward, in which case you don't need these time advances in the reconstruction, the time advances embedded in, the, in this multi-step procedure. I'll show you that in just a second. For example, uh, how do we put this all together into a uh, multi-dimensional unsplit integration step. So we've got reconstruction to get the left and right states, we've got a Riemann solver to compute the fluxes, and in 1D we sort of be done, you know how to do that, but what about in multi-dimensions? Well, uh, you need an unsplit integrator. For, we saw for hydrodynamics things like strang splitting, doing an X sweep, 
and then using the partially updated values to compute the fluxes in the y direction and do a y sweep, and then use those partially updated values to get the fluxes in the z direction, do a z sweep. That works just fine in hydrodynamics, but in MHD, again, because of this div B constraint, you've got to update the magnetic fields all at once, and that means to be consistent, you have to update all the other variables at once, and so you've got to use an unsplit integrator. And the simplest one uh, that uh, we could come up with is a modified version of muscle Hancock, what we call the Van Leer method, which I think is originally due in hydrodynamics due to Sam Fall, and it has, uh, it's very, very simple to see how it works. You first of all compute first order Godnow fluxes at every cell interfaces, you use piecewise constant reconstruction, compute fluxes at every interface in the full 3D domain. And then you use those fluxes to advance the cell-centered solution by half a time step. It's a predict step. And you also update the magnetic field according to CT for half a time step. And then you use those partially updated values at, at uh, T n plus a half to do higher order reconstruction. You compute the left and right states using those time advance values. And then you use those left and right states to compute fluxes. And you don't need a time advance during this reconstruction because you're using a solution which is already at n plus a half to do the reconstruction. It's already time advanced for you. So the reconstruction step doesn't need that characteristic tracing that we talked about. So you use those uh, higher order reconstruction to give your left and right states, compute the fluxes, and then those are the full multidimensional fluxes that you need. You go back to the beginning and you take a full time step uh, the correct step using those new fluxes. You go back to the beginning and start again. So it's kind of like a second order runger kind of method where you take a step for half a time step, you compute new values, and then you go a full time step. Uh, it's a multi-step method. It's second order accurate. You could build in more and more steps and get ever higher order temporal accuracy. Uh, it greatly simplifies the algorithm because you don't need this characteristic tracing step in the LR states. Uh, and so that makes it easier to extend to multi-physics because in, with multiple physics, this characteristic tracing is a lot more complicated. Uh, and uh, you don't need this characteristic decomposition of the li linearized equations. You don't need the linearized Jacobian and the eigenvalues and its eigenvectors to be able to do this reconstruction. So it's a very simple algorithm which works pretty well. But actually, a better one is due to Colella, the coroner transport upwind or so-called CTU method. It's more accurate and can be extended to MHD as well. Uh, how does it work? It's an entirely different unsplit integrator. So you can see that this is sort of modular. You can choose your unsplit integrator as you, as you wish. You can, how does this one work? Well, you compute left and right states, including the time advance using characteristic tracing and those source terms that are needed for multidimensional M MHD. And you use a higher order reconstruction, second or third order reconstruction for this step. Then you compute fluxes from the Riemann solver at the cell faces. And then you correct those left and right states with transverse flux gradients for delta t over 2. And that requires including source terms for MHD. So for example, here q is a vector of conserved quantities now, because you want to do this update in the conserved quantities. q is a vector of conserved quantities at the left uh, and right interface for a cell interface i minus a half. The left interface at i minus a half is evolved according to a flux difference in the y direction in 2D. G are the fluxes in the y direction of the conserved variables. So you take this vector of left states and you add in a delta t over 2 times dg dy, the, the uh, transverse flux gradient, and then you'll need to add in some appropriate source terms for the magnetic field components and momentum components. Uh, for, to account for the uh, sort of dimensional splitting of this step here. And similarly, for the right step, you have the same kind of thing here. And so when you have those updated left and right states, you go back again and you solve the Riemann problem again with these new updated fluxes uh, from the corrected right and uh, left states. And then that, those fluxes are the multidimensional fluxes you need to advance the solution over a full time step. They're multidimensional because they include transverse gradients. They include information about the transverse uh, structure of the solution. So when you do a reconstruction, it's only in one dimension. You're only getting the x variation of the solution. By putting in these gradients, you're also getting the y and in 3D the c uh, uh, distribution of the functions. And you're getting the full multidimensional fluxes. And so that's what you need to advance the solution a full time step. They're time advanced because you use this characteristic tracing step, and they're multidimensional because they contain these flux gradient, uh, transverse flux gradient corrections in them. So this is quite a bit more complicated 
but it is more accurate. And now, you know, you have the Athena code, it's fairly well documented in there, you can go through all the steps in the CDU integrator that are, and the Van Leer integrator that are in, in Athena if you really want to understand how these integrators work. Okay, so one final step in the method for MHD is how you update the magnetic field. We've already said we're going to use CT. How do we make CT work with a Godinov scheme? Because there's an issue here. We need electric fields that are at cell corners here. So there's a 2D mesh, we want the electric field at the corners of the mesh. But the Riemann solver, remember, is returning area average fluxes at cell interfaces. So the area average flux of the magnetic field is the electric field, and that's appearing at cell interfaces here. How do we take the fluxes returned by the Riemann solver at the neighboring cell faces and turn them into a, in, an electric field at the corner? The obvious thing to try would be arithmetic averaging, just to average those four values together, but you can show that doesn't work very well at all. In fact, it's sort of intuitive as to why it doesn't work very well at all, because you, would, you want this method in multi-dimensions to reduce to exactly the same method you would use for a one-dimensional problem if the problem is really planar symmetric, one-dimensional. Suppose I had a solution which is symmetric in the y direction, d by dy is zero. That's essentially a 1D problem. So I want the fluxes returned by the multi-dimensional algorithm to be identical to what you would have gotten if you just solved the problem in 1D. Well, in that case, what I would like is for the um, electric fields for the one-dimensional problem to be given by these two values here, because in one dimension, those are the only non-zero fluxes I'm going to get are at these interfaces. The problem only varies in the x direction. But notice that in 2D, I'd be actually averaging fluxes that are upstream of the actual interface and downstream. So in one dimension, you're adding in these two extra values, which are, you know, in a multidimensional flow, which is plane symmetric, you're adding in these extra values, uh, which are incorrect. In fact, they make the scheme unstable if you do that. And so there's a way to do reconstruction of the electric field rather than averaging, which makes it much, much better. Uh, and, you know, you can demonstrate this by looking at a simple test problem, advection of a very weak magnetic field loop. This is the magnetic energy for a beta million magnetic field loop, but just a, a passive loop of magnetic field which is being advected across the mesh at some weird angle uh, to the grid. And if you just do arithmetic averaging, it's not the best visualization in the world, but you can see that you're beginning to get oscillations in the solution ringing. This is numerical instability which is being damped by the, the dissipation in the integrator. If you use a an accurate, you know, higher order, or a very uh, weakly dissipative integrator, these oscillations get very, very large. You know, you plot slices and it's just ringing. But if you use this reconstruction of the electric fields, then it all looks good. Uh, you don't get this numerical instability. It diffuses a little bit, but it does nothing weird, and the loop stays exactly circular or looks great. No oscillations in the post, you know, uh, outside, the, outside the ring either. And you can actually construct a number of really nasty test problems with this field loop problem. For example, you can do this problem in three dimensions and have this field loop be a cylinder, so it's symmetric in the z direction, and you're just advecting it in the xy plane, everything's symmetric in z. And you can add a uniform vz velocity to that problem. Again, nothing should change. It should remain absolutely symmetric in the xy plane, uh, and the flow along the magnetic field shouldn't change anything. But the actual equations of motion uh, have a term which is Vz times div b, basically. The, the z component of the magnetic field is being evolved according to Vz times div b. Of course, analytically, div b is zero. That term is canceled off. But numerically, if your, if your difference representation of div b is not correct, you will not have div b zero numerically, and b z will grow. So you do this problem with a non-zero v z, you set b z equal to zero initially, you track b z. If b z does not stay absolutely zero to machine uh, error, you know that your method is not keeping div b zero properly. So that's a very, very sensitive test on what is the appropriate discretization of div b that you're supposed to keep zero. There was being a long debate about, well, you know, there's different ways to construct discretizations of div b. Uh, CT keeps one particular discretization zero, but why is that any more important than any other? I think this test problem is a way to answer that question, because whatever discretization you're using in the code, it should keep bz exactly zero for that test, and if it doesn't, you've got the wrong discretization kept to zero. So suffice to say that this CT method does keep that 
value of bz exactly zero. It's a very, very sensitive test. So we have now everything together. Let me just say a few words about there are other ways to do, uh, do it, uh, other ways to keep div b zero that are used in methods. Uh, for example, you can do nothing and uh, assume that the errors are small, but you and I both know what happens when you assume. Uh, so I don't know anybody that still really does this. Most people build in something special to keep div b equals zero. You can evolve b using the vector potential, where the field comes from the curl of the potential. Uh, that requires taking second differences to compute Lorentz forces, not always the best thing to do. You can you remove the solenoidal part of B using something called flux cleaning. That is, you can set the magnetic field at the end of every time step to be B minus the gradient of some potential phi, where phi satisfies this elliptic equation, del squared phi is minus div B. That requires solving this elliptic PDE every time step which gets very expensive because it's a global solve. It's an elliptic problem, and especially on a large number of processors, that can be a limiting step in the calculation. And it also may smooth discontinuities because you're solving an elliptic problem and then using that to subtract from the magnetic field. However, this is, I would say, the second most popular way of keeping div b equals zero in Godinov schemes is using this flux cleaning method. You can use Powell's so-called eight-wave solver, which tries to add a new characteristic to MHD proportional to div B, and so it advects this, the errors in div B off the solution. Unfortunately, it's been shown that in some cases you get the wrong jump conditions for some shock problems, and also there are some pl places where this characteristic doesn't actually advect it away. There is sort of a stagnation point in the flow, and the div B error can, can, uh, can grow there, so you really have to tune this to work well. And then finally, we can use what we're doing, which is constrained transport. But these are all different options, and I've really only talked a lot about this one, uh, although other ones, some of the other ones here are popular, and you may be using some of them. I just wanted you to be aware of them. Another feature of these methods is something called the carbuncle instability. Not all codes have them, but some of these single step methods, for example, have this carbuncle instability. What is that, and how do you fix it? Well, the problem is really that these methods are have too little dissipation sometimes. There, you might think of them as being too good. There are too little dissipation added in some problems. Small perturbations in an upstream flow produce large perturbations in the post-shock gas for a shock front. So having small, too little dissipation is a bad thing because if you have a grid-aligned shock, the transverse dissipation is extremely small. In the direction perpendicular, you know, parallel to the shock front, the dissipation there is very, very small. So tiny little perturbations in the upstream flow produce big changes in the downstream pressure, and those pressure gradients drive flow in the transverse direction, and it's not damped because there's too little dissipation in the transverse direction. It can produce growth, an unstable growth of that, you know, amplification of those perturbations in the shock fronts, and there's a feedback cycle where those amp you know, the perturbations are amplified, that makes the pressure gradients larger, that makes the flow bigger, which makes the perturbations larger, and away it runs. It's a numerical instability called the carbuncle instability. And this solution is very simple. You just need to increase the dissipation in the transverse direction, but only for grid-aligned shocks. And one way you can do that is something called the H-correction in the row Riemann solver. And how does that work? Well, you replace the eigenvalues, the wave speeds, in Rho's linearization, the lambda alphas, those are all the characteristics, uh, all the different eigenvalues of the Jacobian, you replace that with the, the maximum of the value returned originally by the 1D solver and some function eta bar uh, at the interface. So I'm sitting here at the interface I minus a half J, and I'm calculating the uh, eigenvalues to use for the Rho's linearization for the Riemann solver applied at this interface. Well, I will use the values I got from my sort of original 1D method plus an eta bar at this cell, where eta bar is an average of eta over the five cells next to this, in sort of an H shape, an H on its edge. That's why it's called the H correction. You average the uh, wave speeds from the nearest five cells. These etas are just the averages of the U plus Cs here, the, uh, the, the average of the flow speed and the, and the fast magnetosonic speed for MHD. So what does that do if you're at a, a transverse, if you're at a, a um, if you're at a shock front, one of these uh, X points here will contain the fluxes across the shock and will have a lot of dissipation in it, and you'll pick up those values when you average over these, these different etas at, the, at these crosses. 
And so this is a way of automatically detecting shocks in multi-dimensions and adding just the right amount of dissipation to the transverse di direction to, to uh, fix this carbuncle. And you can see how well this works with something like the NOAA shock tube. That's a problem where you flow cold gas at Mach infinity. Well, you can't really do infinity, so you do like Mach a million. So Mach million shock front here. You flow the gas into the corner, it generates a shock front which propagates outward. Picture of the density, here's the shock front at some later time. And you notice that at all intermediate angles where the shock is at oblique angle to the grid, no problem. But where the shock is aligned with the grid, at these two locations you get little features. You get numerical instability, which should not be there. And if you use the H correction, those things go away. And my solution is exactly spherically symmetric and is the correct solution. So this, so it works you know, automatically detecting grid aligned shocks and turning on extra dissipation in the transverse direction. So not a real issue because it's so easy to fix, but you've got to be aware of it and you've got to fix it if it's present in, the, in your scheme. How do we do boundary conditions? Uh, I've talked about this before uh, in, this, in the Zeus code. Uh, they're implemented by specifying the solution in ghost cells. I showed this picture from the Zeus code, but it's the same kind of concept. You add extra rows of cells beyond the edge of the grid, uh, and you swap the, or you set the solution in those uh, cells according to some set of rules. Things like reflecting, inflow, outflow, periodic are all standard and most codes would implement them, and, uh, and then you swap those ghost zones every time step in order to keep the, the solution up to date. Now, my only point I wanted to make here was that this unsplit integrator with PPM requires four rows of ghost cells to be passed. You need three because the piecewise parabolic reconstruction has a difference molecule, that is, it spreads over up to three cells in the upwind direction. And you need a fourth cell because this uh, corner transport upwind is doing uh, a partial update, a predictor-corrector kind of a step, and that requires you have to update one of these ghost cells so that when you do the full update, you have the right solution at the cell boundaries. So this gives you a limit of how much data you have to pass. I mean, you want to pass as few rows as possible to make the scheme efficient, but you can't pass any less than four. That's the minimum you can pass with this unsplit integrators and PPM. If you use piecewise linear, you only need three rows of cells. If you use piecewise linear and a split integrator, which unfortunately you can't do for MHD, but if you're doing hydro, an, an, a PLM plus unsplit integrator, you'd only need two. So the more, more complicated your algorithm, the more rows you need to add, it seems. Now, the good thing about these methods is that the boundary conditions are only applied once per time step, so it's more efficient for parallelization. You only have to pass the data once, unlike split methods where you've got to pass the boundary conditions at every partial update. And finally, an implementation issue is that it's very easy to add new boundary conditions by using things like function pointers in C. Uh, the, the code actually calls just a function specified through a pointer. And as, as a user, you just write a new function that does whatever boundary condition you want, and then you enroll it when you start the calculation, and that allows you the flexibility to solve any problem with any kind of boundary condition without having to change the code at all. You just have to add a new function that sets the boundaries the way you want. So no real new concepts for boundary conditions for god -knot methods. So let me say a few words about implementation, and then I'll use Athena as an example of, of how this might proceed. There are two versions. Uh, the C version is the developmental version. I would say it's the most capable, it has the most features. The Fortran 90 is probably the cleanest because it had the advantage of taking the algorithm as it works and sort of starting from scratch and re-implementing it again in the cleanest way possible. That was written by John Hawley and Jake Simon at the University of Virginia, and so there's a web page at Virginia for the F90 version, and there's a web page here at Princeton for the C version. The driving features of that de developed this code were, first of all, modularity. Make it easy to extend so that things like the Riemann solver, the reconstruction algorithms, they're all just functions with a common interface. So I can easily add a new Riemann solver to the code just by adding a new file with a new Riemann solver as a new function or a new integrator as has been recently done, just by adding a new function, a new file with that integrator function um, added. Ease of use was a driving uh, uh, goal here. Uh, I hope my, my secret wish is that you're going to find Athena is really easy to use for the homework, and that it was easy to install, compile, and run. And that wasn't an accident, because I have lived through having to install libraries 
uh, and dependencies on previous codes that I've written, and I got fed up with it. And, and really, the goal here is to have a code which is absolutely uh, easy to use, having configure, never relying on external libraries, and having a very intuitive input uh, file mechanism, which is enabled by a special parser that Peter Toybin wrote for us, which has a very intuitive format and very, very flexible format allowing you to add, add uh, data. You know, problem with C is it doesn't have a very, it has very, very powerful uh, string handling capability, but sort of no default, uh, easy, intuitive string handling capability. So, so it needed a parser to be able to handle that. And again, portability, which is related to ease of use, uh, strict inherent in adherence to ANSI standards. Don't ever use language extensions, as attractive as they may seem, and oh gosh, that would be great to use that language extension. Unfortunately, it makes the code non-portable, so don't use them. And then don't use external libraries, except when absolutely necessary. For example, if you're going to run parallel calculations, you've got to have the MPI library. And I ain't going to write an MPI library, obviously, so I'm going to use somebody else's. So that, of course, the code relies on the MPI library. It relies on FFTW to do FFTs, but the code doesn't need them. You can run problems that don't require those libraries, and I think that's important for portability. And then finally, performance. These unsplit integrators, and there's no way around this, require very large numbers of 3D arrays because you have to build up the fluxes at every interface in full 3D at once and update the solution for a full time step. There's no way around it. You're going to have to at least store the fluxes, but then you're going to have to store other intermediate values that go into computing those fluxes. So it quickly gets out of hand. You need up to 100 3D arrays to, uh, to do this unsplit methods in 3D. But it turns out that the amount of work you need to do per cell, around 10 to the 4 flops, is already so large, the overall method in our experience is CPU bound, not memory bound. I've never run into a machine that didn't have enough memory per node that I couldn't run an interesting problem on it. Instead, I always use less memory than what's available because I can't afford enough grid cells. Uh, you know, otherwise, it would take half an hour to do one time step if I use all the memory available on, on each node. So I'm always CPU bound, not memory bound. This configure uh, is one of the neatest tricks that, uh, again, Peter Toybin had us use, I think, because it, it allows a very, very intuitive and very, very flexible way to include more physics. And if you do a dash C option on the command line, the code burps out all the different uh, options that are controlled by configure, both physics options and also algorithm options. And I think that's a very useful way, if you have a complex code, uh, to control all those different things. Parallelization for grid codes is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're using MPI and domain decomposition, and I, I don't really think I need to explain how that works because I think you're all familiar with it. Uh, so the, only a few points here of, of relevance. First of all, you can use any arbitrary decomposition in X, Y, and Z. You can decompose in one dimension, which would give you slabs, two dimensions, which would be pencils, three dimensions would be blocks. And really, when you have a very large number of processors, NP, blocks are best because they optimize the area to volume ratio, which is uh, related to how much data you have to swap between the processors. So really, the, the block code is the best way to go on very large numbers of, of processors. You can compute an optimum decomposition to minimize data communication automatically with grid methods because the amount of work per grid cell is fixed, so you know how much work and how much data has to be passed per grid cell. So you, if you once you know NP, you can let the code compute what the decomposition should be to minimize the data. There's no diagonal communication required between grids. So that is to say, if I have a two-dimensional mesh of domains, MPI domains, I've split up domains in X and in Y, and I have a two-dimensional grid of domains, I only need to pass data in the X and Y directions. I don't need to pass it along the diagonal. So I only need two MPI calls in uh, 2D and three in MPI calls in 3D, uh, as long as I do these sweeps sequentially. I do an X sweep and then I do a Y sweep with the already swapped data. That guarantees the data in the, in the diagonal goes in X and then to Y and it makes its way to the corner appropriately. And in 3D it'll shuffle its way around X, Y, Z and end up in the right place. So you don't need calls all across the diagonal. As I mentioned, balancing workload is easy for good codes because the flops per zone is fixed. You can even overlap work and communication, uh, although I've never done this because it greatly complicates the coding. I know other people who do. The idea is that if you have a, an MPI block of cells, you need to pass the outer four cells to your neighboring processor 
uh, uh, so what you do is you start working on the outer ring of cells first. And after you've updated the outer ring of four cells, you can start an MPI communication. And then you go back and you finish the interior part of that MPI grid block. And when you're done that, you go back and your, your data should be sitting waiting for you. So you can interleave communication and work and potentially make it more efficient. Communication is a pretty small step in these codes, or pretty small contribution to the overall execution. So I, I haven't actually done this, but I know people who do, and it works pr pretty well. Uh, I've tried using OpenMP and multi-core processors, but for the current generation of multi-core, I don't find it performs any better than pure MPI, so I just continue to use pure MPI. Uh, OpenMP can save you a little bit of memory, because you don't need the ghost cells around the MPI blocks, so you save those four cells for, this, for the data that's on the cores, but it's not enough to worry about. So, Oh, so far, a mixed mode parallelization hasn't been any help. Maybe when this gets to be hundreds of thousands, it's going to be different. And then finally, we're using an FFT par paralyzed by uh, slab decomposition. A big problem with paralyzing FFTs, FFTW only provides slab decomposition. If you go to a large number of processors, a thousand processors, you get a thousand slabs. There's not enough data in these slabs for it to be very efficient. You really want to have block decomposition for a large number of processors. Well, there's an interface to FFTW written by Steve Plimpton you can download off the web. We've used it. It works extremely well. And it allows you to do slab decomposition using FFTW. And in large numbers of processors, it definitely wins Sorry, did I just say it allows you to use block decomposition on large number of processors, and it definitely wins over slab on a large number of processors. So if you're using FFTs and this is an issue for you, I encourage you to look into that. Finally, domain decomposition and multi-core, uh, you need to do this to ensure locality. That is to say, here's a two-dimensional mesh of MPI blocks. So here's some domain that I've broken up into what is it, eight by eight MPI blocks, so a total of 64 processors. The, the naive thing to do is to take this MPI block and put it on that core, and this one on that core, and walk along the X direction and put these MPI blocks on cores in, in a linear fashion. But then uh, when you go in the Y direction, this block here needs to talk to that one, but this block will be in a processor way over here somewhere, so it has to go sort of globally through the, through the network to get to the data it needs from another processor. Better to stick these four blocks together on this one processor. That way, this, this core has all its neighbors next to it here. And similarly, this one here needs the, those blocks, and this one here needs that block. So by making an array of arrays, ma making this, uh, you know, these dark lines here sort of represent the decomposition onto processors, and the, the square, the smaller blocks are the decomposition onto cores. Uh, this makes it increases locality. In fact, we've seen this before. It's nothing more than the Pino Hilbert ordering for space filling curves. Basically, you know, this curve tells you to put those four on this core here, and then this four is going to go on there, and so on and so forth. So the Pino Hilbert curve, which is useful for tree codes for improving locality, it's the same concept here just cast in a slightly different way for grid codes. And that's, a, that's for multi-core, a potential improvement. So with Athena, we've run some tests on machines out to 25,000 cores. And we've done weak scaling tests. Uh, I'm sort of a fan of weak scaling tests, because if I'm going to use a machine with 25,000 cores, I'm not going to use the same grid that I'm going to use for two cores. So I want to know what the performance is for a very, very big grid that requires lots of memory when I'm running out here at 25,000 cores. So I only present the weak scaling results, and I present it in terms of speed up divided by number of processors, the efficiency, how fast the code is running per core compared to what it would have run if it was only run in one core by itself to begin with. And you can, it's been uh, two different curves here. Depending on whether you use two cores per processor, this, this was a machine that had dual core, two cores per processor. Uh, if you use both cores, you got the, the bottom lines. And if you used only one core, you could only use 12,500 uh, MPI blocks, but you've got these two curves here. And the, the uh, blue and the red depends on whether you had 64 cubed cells per MPI block or 32 cubed. The main difference here is the amount of data that has to be communicated. Chi is the ratio of data uh, calculated to communicated. And you can see that. Uh, there, you know, basically the entire, you know, very, very tiny fraction, negligible fraction of the grid is communicated 
uh, so this, this chi is the wrong way around. This, this, a very large fraction of the data is communicated at 32 cubed, 64 cubed is very, very small. And uh, you see that uh, for the single, single core per processor, the scaling is around 95%, and the most important thing is it remains nice and flat. It doesn't really change, even down to 25,000 cores using two cores per processor, it again remains very, very flat. And most of the jump is in the first few you know, processors, that's, that is to say, uh, running on one versus two makes a big difference, and then after that, it's sort of flat uh, out here. This was actually on a, a Cray XT3. I'm sorry? Why is this not monotonic? Oh boy, if I knew the answer, I mean, this really gets into the real guts of the hardware. Where were those cores located? What was the network connecting them? You know, there's the sort of pathologies in the machine, depending on how the scheduler spread the job across the cores and so on. So I really don't know why that little blip is there, uh, but there it is. And that's the sort of thing that you see all the time when you run jobs on large number of processors. Okay. Uh, we're using something called uh, track now to keep track of bugs uh, in the code. I, I'll try showing this maybe. I think I have time here. Uh, so if you're not already doing this and you're starting to work on big codes, then you're already using software repositories, I assume, like CVS or SVN. But it, uh, in our experience, having something that keeps track of bugs is also a useful thing. There's lots of uh, you know, free software you, you can use to do that. Track is a nice piece of software because it connects to the SVN repository directly. It allows you to browse the repository uh, and uh, you know, have, so you have a graphical interface to SVN plus it keeps this bug tracking ability. Uh, so this should bring up the Athena track site and uh, if I log in, so you get all these choices along the top. You can do things like there's a wiki connected to it so you can do things like uh, stick the documentation online, so, so that user manual that comes in the slash doc uh, directory with the code is now all online. You can, you know, check the configure and you get all the latest configure options. So that makes it very, very useful, even for my own students, because when somebody changes something, the documentation gets out of date, well now it can be kept up to date. But you can also do things like uh, look at what the bug tickets are, and you know, here's full disclosure, you can see what our current bugs are right now. The color codes them according to the importance, so the red ones are things we really, really need to fix, like we have a bug in the HLD flux right now. A lot of these things are things that we just want to do in the future. So there are also ways, if you're, if you're working on a distributed code project with more than one person uh, working on the code at once, and maybe you're not on the same place, this is a way for people sort of to post uh, statement, you know, comments and uh, tickets that, so you know what's going on where and you know why the code changes. So again, uh, this is all very personal as to what you like and uh, what your choice is, but in our experience this is turning out to be useful. Right now this track site uh, requires a login, but my goal is to make this open to the public. Within a few months anybody can visit the site and view it. You won't be able to commit to the SVN repository, but you will be able to browse the repository. Uh, so we're trying to move towards more open source as this code gets mature. Okay, so let me turn to some test problems, uh, and then I'll conclude with uh, comparisons to SPH and, and uh, Galilean invariance. The tests that we've found most useful are drawn from the basic physics of MHD that we talked about in, M8, in lecture one. Things like linear wave convergence, it's a very quantitative test, or nonlinear waves, both Alphane waves and shocks. This field loop advection test that I showed you was very, very helpful in tracking the best way to do CT in Godinoff methods. And then these MHD instabilities are also very useful. You really must focus on multidimensional tests because that's what you're going to be using the code for. It's especially important in MHD because in 1D, the div B constraint's trivial. In multidimensions, the div B constraint is not. And so you need to be really doing multidimensional tests. There's a whole pile of test problems on the Athena webpage, and you can use those to help compare against your own codes. For so here, for example, is the linear wave convergence test, done in full 3D at some oblique angle to the grid, so the, the wave vector is some angle, it's not at 45 degrees. You initialize a pure eigen mode of each wave family in MHD, that means the fast magnetosonic wave, the Alphane wave, 
the slow magnetic sonic and the entropy wave were the contact. And then you uh, evolve it with periodic boundary conditions for one cycle, and then you calculate the L1 error, the difference between the numerical solution and the analytic solution, and you plot that versus resolution. And you should see it converging at a slope equal to the order of your scheme. So these lines are all straight lines at minus two. These are all second order methods. So the scheme is converging at second order for all four wave families. Uh, and moreover, you can com intercompare the different integrators. This uh, blue line, this muscle, is the Van Leer's integrator I mentioned. And this red line, CTU6, is the current CTU integrator that we use. And you notice that the CTU integrator is less dissipative than the Van Leer integrator for these linear wave convergence tests. That's the you know, basis for my statement that CTU was better. It was more accurate because it's measurably less dissipative than, the, than the, uh, this muscle, this uh, Van Leer integrator. And you can do all sorts of very careful tests. These are all for left-going waves. In fact, this is one of your, your homework problems, of course, was to look at this, this wave family here. You can do left waves, but then you can also do right-going waves. And the code should return the exact same answer to machine precision, to, er to arbitrary numbers of div digits for left and right-going waves, because they're obviously exactly the same. And if you don't, if you find a small difference, even at the last digit between left and right-going waves, you should be worried about it. Maybe there's something in your code that's a bug. You know, maybe it's just round off, but maybe there's something in the code that's a bug that you really need to look into. And indeed, we found a number of bugs in the uh, linearization in Rose Solver by doing these tests. You know, all of the wave families would work except for the right-going Alphane wave. And we'd say, well, what the heck's that going on with that? And sure enough, there would be a bug somewhere in the linearization. And so this is a very, very helpful way of finding very, very subtle bugs. You can do nonlinear versions of these waves, alphane waves. Circularly polarized alphane waves are an exact solution. You know, they're an exact nonlinear solution to the MHD equation. So here's the magnetic field evolution of a, for an alphane wave propagating at an oblique angle of the grid. Here's a slice at some later time uh, at different resolutions. Eight by four grid cells, this dotted line up to 128 by 64. And the 128 by 64 is indistinguishable from the analytic solution. Uh, even the 8 by 4, which is approaching the Nyquist frequency for what you can resolve on the grid, you can't resolve a sine wave uh, at less than that, is even showing a little bit of wave oscillation. So that ain't bad, actually. Uh, and you can, again, measure the convergence rate of these waves uh, because it's, this quali it's a quantitative test. When this, this test was originally proposed, there was a concern that there's a parametric instability, which is a feature of nonlinear circularly polarized alphane waves. There's a parametric instability that exists that, that causes them to break up into fast and slow waves. Uh, but for the parameters chosen for this problem, this parametric instability does not exist. Nonetheless, you can see people who have done this test problem, and it's reduced into zone-to-zone -zone oscillations, and they say it's the parametric instability, and we've captured it correctly. Unfortunately, it's not the parametric instability. It doesn't exist for these parameter values, and you shouldn't be getting zone-to-zone -zone oscillations in this problem. It's useful to do shock tubes, but in incline them at the mesh. Do them in multi-dimensions. Don't do them in 1D. 1D is too easy with MHD. So you set the left and right states up at some oblique angle, and then you, the shock front propagates perpendicular to the, to the initial interface, and then you look at the solution along the line. Setting this up is non-trivial, because the cells at the interface are crossed by both the left and right states, and you somehow have to specify the correct volume average values uh, at the interface cells, which is non-trivial. Uh, but it, with a little bit of work, it can be done. And these are the profiles you get for the Rue Jones 2A shock tube, which looks remarkably uh, like the 1D result, as it should. We, you know, we capture all seven waves in this test, shocks, uh, rare, uh, sorry, shocks, rotational discontinuities, and contact discontinuities, with only a few cells, even in multi-dimensions, and no additional ringing or so on. So if you take the 1D plots, compare them to this, they look very, very much the same. You can do uh, an interesting test that was in a, a nice paper by Liska and Wendroff. I recommend this paper to everyone doing hydrodynamics. It contains a comparison of many different codes on a whole set of different problems. And they present this one sort of uh, in, you know, imaginative, let me say, problem. It involves a uh, box with reflecting walls, a uh, diagonal cutout which has low pressure, low density, and the rest of the volume filled with high pressure, high density. It's basically the sod shock tube problem, 
done in two dimensions with reflecting boundary conditions. The conditions here are very close to the sod problem. And so you let her rip, so you get a shock and rarefaction produced. Notice what happens along the wall here. You get a double Mach reflection because the shock is hitting the boundary at an oblique angle. We saw that problem the other day as a test. You get a double Mach reflection with these little jets produced along the wall, which are characteristic of the double Mach reflection interaction. And as they move along towards the corner, they interact and then they spit each other out as one large vortex along the diagonal. Meanwhile, the shocks are bouncing around inside here. They hit these interfaces. They produce something called the rickmeyer meshkov instability because they're crossing density interfaces. But you get this jet along the diagonal. Uh, the Liska and Wendorf paper showed a bunch of results for different codes, some which get this and some which don't. And they left it uncertain as to what the right answer is. But I think the right answer is a jet along the diagonal. And I think it only happens when you get codes which in, in, enforce symmetry in the xy dimension. Because you get to get these vortices hitting the corner exactly the same time, so they spit out along the diagonal. And if you use directionally split methods, you don't get exact symmetry in the x and y direction, and you don't get that jet. When you use unsplit integrators, you do get that jet. So an additional benefit of using these unsplit integrators, which they're necessary for MHD, but a benefit of them is that they, you get excellent maintenance of symmetry in multi-dimensions by these methods. You can look at other instabilities. I'll show you the rickmeyer meshkov because it's kind of a fun one. It occurs when you have an impulsive acceleration of a dense fluid by a less dense fluid. For example, when a shock crosses a contact discontinuity from the light fluid uh, into the, into the uh, heavy fluid, or sorry, the other way around, heavy into light. Uh, it's subject to a Raleigh-Taylor-like instability. It's got algebraic rather than exp exponential growth. How do you show this problem? Again, you know, we're making this up out of, out of, our, you know, out of our imagination, but th this is a nice initial condition. This is not a very quantitative test, but it's qualitative. You set up a domain with uniform density and pressure, and in a small circular region, you increase the pressure by a factor of 100. It's going to generate a set-off Taylor blast wave that moves outwards. You use periodic boundary conditions so the shock wave will come through the boundaries and come back in and interact with uh, the, the central part. Uh, and we'll see what happens when we do hydro and when we do a magnetic field inclined at 45 degrees, the MHD version of this test, with a very small beta, 0.1, so we have a very strong influence of the magnetic field. There goes the hydro problem. And again, these unsplit integrators keep uh, symmetry extremely well. The shock front is nice and spherically symmetric. Uh, and here's the low density bubble and a contact discontinuity generated at the interior. You do the MHD problem, and it, it's qualitatively different from the beginning because there's a magnetic field at 45 degrees, and so the, the wave speeds perpendicular and parallel are different. You get a fast shock front moving perpendicular, and notice there's only one shock and then the contact, whereas along here, at intermediate angles, you get a fast, a slow, and then the contact. So there, you can see this is the Friedrichs diagram for you, but it, with nonlinear waves in some sense because you can see how the wave families are changing with angle. Uh, uh, and you can see how this, this uh, bubble is being confined by the magnetic pressure into a sort of an elongated shape here. So the fun begins when you let it continue. The shocks you know, come across the periodic boundaries. They hit those interfaces. Uh, and you begin to see little fingers, which are the rickmeyer meshkov They grow slowly because it's, it's algebraic growth. But eventually, they leave these little, and then you get secondary KH. They leave these fingers, which get secondary KH, which roll them up as little mushroom caps. And then you get a shock from the top, which compresses the bubble the other way. And you get rectumar meshkov, and it turns into a sort of a Rorschach diagram here. You know, What do you think that looks like? Uh, and that's what happens at the end. Uh, and in the MHD test, uh, well, interestingly enough, the rickmeyer meshkov instability doesn't exist. That's because the magnetic field here is parallel to this interface. And the fingers would have to pull the, the field out. And the magnetic tension is strong enough to suppress uh, the, the uh, rickmeyer meshkov instability. And it just remains this nice, smooth interface. So sorry? Uh, yes? In the, in the test, yes. The, the uh, to produce those fingers? Yes, the internal, the internal shock I mean, this, this here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So these perturbations grow. Yes, they grow because, again, if you, didn't, if, you, if you don't have these periodic boundary conditions, the perturbations never get worse than this. So the, so the seed for the... Pardon me? So the instability doesn't come from G. 
those are what seed the instability. There, there exists a hydrodynamic instability here. It would not grow unless you gave it perturbations. The perturbations are coming from the grid. That's absolutely right. But it's the combination of the existence of the instability plus the uh, perturbation that makes it grow into these fingers at the end. In other words, you do not get these long fingers with KH if the blast wave doesn't come back and interact with that interface. If the blast wave just goes off to infinity and you leave this interface alone, it just grows into a circle and diffuses and nothing happens. That's correct. But no explosion in nature is going to be completely spherical. You just need, you know, absolutely tiny perturbations to, for, to seed something here. I mean, uh, it's an unstable flow. It's a hydrodynamically unstable flow. You sneeze on it, it's going to grow. So, you know, there it is, you know. Uh, you know, it's like those hot, humid days. They're going to have a thunderstorm because it's impossible to stop convection from going. It's going to go. You know, maybe it can stay stratified with high entropy in the bottom, but it won't. It'll go. Yes. No, I mean, this is another, another great test of symmetry. I mean, yes, you're right. It's too late now. I've gone too far. But the uh, notice, even in the deep nonlinear regime, all of those features are symmetric, top to bottom, left to right. That's, we, we, we didn't exploit image symmetries. That's the whole computational domain. It's because we're using an unsplit integrator, which is keeping things symmetric, exactly. I can, I can difference the top and bottom and calculate what the differences are, and they're like machine round off. So again, these features are symmetric because of the integrator. Uh, it's because the initial perturbations were exactly symmetric, and so on and so forth. Let me move on to uh, mesh refinement. Uh, fortunately, this is a topic that crosses many of the application codes that we're talking about here. And Franz Pretorius, for example, is going to be talking about AMR. Uh, Mike Norman, I think, probably has something to say about it. So I don't feel like I need to say a whole lot about it. I can just say that AMR works for MHD2. You have to use divergence-free prolongation and restriction operators when you convert between coarse and find solutions when you project and uh, average the solutions. You've got to make sure you keep the divergence-free constraint satisfied. So there, fortunately, Toth and Rowe have worked out operators that do that for you automatically. You also need the flux correction algorithms between the fine and coarse meshes that are necessary to ensure conservation so you don't get spurious reflections off internal boundaries. That has to be uh, modified so that it keeps the div B constraint between the fine and coarse boundaries exactly satisfied as well. But again, within CT, you just work with the electric fields. The electric fields are the fluxes of the magnetic field. And so by appropriate uh, uh, flux correction of the electric fields, you can keep div B equals zero. And we've used it to do uh, static mesh refinement for stratified disks in the shearing box, where the turbulence is driven by the MRI. So we have fine grids at the midplane where we can resolve the turbulence at small scales and coarser grids above and below. This is not adaptive, but it's static. It's fixed for all time because we know the midplane is always just going to be sitting here, and that makes it a much more efficient algorithm not to have to do the adaptivity. There is an AMR version which uses the same prolongation restriction operators and the same flux correction uh, with an in-house grid generation and destruction algorithm written by Tom Gardner. We, we looked into using packages like Chombo, an excellent package, uh, really worth looking into. Unfortunately, it required such substantial changes to our own code in order to, to mesh with Chombo. In the end, Tom thought it was easier just to write his own grid generation and destruction functions. And so this is now an all an in-house AMR method, which here, for example, is a little test showing the Rowley-Taylor instability with a magnetic field in the horizontal direction showing the grid levels and the, the resulting solution. Uh, and then here's another AMR test that, uh, that, that blast wave uh, in the, the Liskow-Wendrov explosion in a box problem. And here is the single grid version, and here's the AMR version. So the beauty here is you can actually do a head-to-head -head comparison. You don't always see a comparison between a single fixed grid at the highest resolution of the AMR right next to the AMR. And you can see directly what the AMR does for you. First of all, the AMR has captured all the gross features exactly correctly. But it's made the solution a lot smoother. 
A lot of these very short wavelength waves here, they're not wrong, it's not numerical noise, it's caused by shock waves refracting off these density interfaces. And that generates short frequency, you know, high frequency short wavelength noise, which then propagates out into these smooth regions and is you know, still visible with a fixed grid. But with the AMR, the smooth regions are so coarse, those waves get damped away and you don't see them anymore. So you sort of, is it better or is it worse? You get rid of high frequency stuff, but actually that stuff is real. And you know, it sort of shows you the consequences of using AMR. You do change the solution to some degree. So let, in the last uh, 20 minutes, let me turn to two final topics, comparing these codes to SPH and, and, and Galilean invariance. First of all, uh, SPH. You know, we, we all know it's an extremely useful tool for studying high dynamical flows with gravity. For example, cosmological structure formation. You know, a great number of very important results have come from SPH calculations of structure formation. Here's a picture, but I could have downloaded dozens of pictures from the web. Here's one from uh, Volker and Lars Hernquist uh, showing structure formation with SPH. And achieving the same dynamic range with a grid code is very challenging. You know, uh, not impossible, but it's very, very challenging. You know, much more difficult, I think, uh, algorithmically to get the same kind of dynamic range you sort of get automatically with SPH. But nonetheless, I'd still say that for basic fluid dynamical processes without gravity, uh, grid codes are often better. Not always, but often better. And one way to see this is to do a more realistic sod shock tube test with SPH. Don't do it in 1D, but do it in 3D, full 3D, because that's what the kind of problem you're going to be running, and show all the particles in the calculation. So there's a paper by Razio and Shapiro that does this. This is the sod shock tube run with SPH, showing you all the particles. So there's the result for the sod shock tube run with SPH in full 3D. Uh, you know, better, more modern codes do much better. So here's gadget two. And I tried running it, but Vocker did much better than I. So I'm showing his result for the sod shock tube run with gadget two uh, using all the particles. And you know, so that's the result you get for the sod shock tube uh, in full 3D showing you all the particles. And again, there's things you can do to improve this with SPH. For example, you can use an initial condition, which is a glass. I mean, most of this uh, is caused by noise in the particle positions initially. If you use a glass, which is a very careful way of adjusting the particle positions initially to reduce the noise, you get a much better solution to the shod shock tube test. Uh, so again, this is shod run with uh, glass, and this is showing all the particles, and it looks much, much better. But, but unfortunately, glass is probably not a good description of how particles will be distributed in a real calculation. You know, who knows how the particles are distributed, but they're probably not going to be glass. So you're going to get something between the purely random case, which I showed you before, and this glass case. If you bin the, SODs, the SPH solution to a mesh, it looks pretty good. And so here's error bars plotted on top of the bin solution using a glass, and you see error bars show you how much noise there are in the solution. Uh, I'm sorry you can't see this, but here's the Athena solution from the grid. That's really too bad. But the point is that it looks very, very similar, you know, maybe a little less diffusive with Athena. And this was run on a 50 cubed grid at, at an oblique angle. It's got to be fair, so this is a full 3D test with a grid code, the shock front run at some weird angle to the mesh, not along, the, along one uh, grid direction. And so you get sort of comparable uh, accuracy, but this was a million particles and it took several hours to run, and this takes about one minute to run. So I would say that grid codes do shock capturing, for example, in multi-dimensions better, and that's why they, they might be something that uh, you want to use for just fluid dynamical problems without, without um, gravity. And more recently, there's been a code comparison test for supersonic MHD turbulence, no gravity. So this is just decay of turbulence like the images I showed you last time is one of the applications for grid codes. And this is the Fourier power spectra. Here's the wave number, the Fourier power spectra of the magnetic field. Uh, it's been compensated, multiplied by k to the 5 thirds. So Kolmogorov should be a flat line in this curve. And it's showing you a bunch of different curves for different lines and the SPH result from a newly developed MHD SPH algorithm down here. And so it's quite a bit more diffusive for this decay of turbulence problem. By the way, the Zeus is the yellow line and PPM is the blue line. And again, that follows what I was trying to show last time. It's you know, about a factor of two or so less dissipative. PPM is about a factor of two less dissipative than Zeus. So I would say taken together, all of these results uh, suggest that SPH is really wonderful for problems where gravity dominates, but if you're solving you know, pure fluid dynamical problems, I think grid codes might be more cost effective. 
but not necessarily the best thing to use, but, I, but it's uh, something to think about. I mean, that's really the application domain, I think, where grid codes can really make a contribution. Now, this Galilean invariance is an important issue. Um, so there's much discussion recently because Volker has shown in a very nice paper, a beautiful paper, uh, inter, you know, discussing lots of interesting issues, that when you run a certain set of problems in different frames of reference by boosting them with a constant background velocity, you get different solutions with grid codes. So let me focus on one, this uh, calvin helmholtz instability. Take uh, a, a periodic domain and you have a density two fluid in the middle moving to the right, and a density fluid one flu uh, t on the top and bottom moving to the left, and you put in a resolved perturbation of the interface with a sine wave, you know, two wavelengths per box here, and then you let that evolve and you run it in a frame which is at rest uh, with respect to the mass here and you find these Kelvin Helmholtz cat's eye rolls as you might expect at the both uh, interfaces. But as you boost it to higher frames using Mach 1 and then Mach 10, you see that these cat's eyes go away. It looks like the instability is going away. It's not really gone away. Something's going on here because this interface did not stay sharp. Something has mixed the fluid, something's gone unstable here, but you don't see these cat size. So this is a bit worrisome. You, you might think naively that these should be the same, but is that true? So why aren't these grid codes Galilean invariant? Well, because remember the 1D fluxes of conserved variables. For example, the X flux is just this uh, vector of quantities here. Notice that VX appears everywhere. So the flux of the conserved variables is not Galilean invariant. Numerical algorithms, like I've just described, are approximating this flux to some order, you know, first order, second order, third order, whatever. Uh, and the truncation error of that approximation cannot be Galilean invariant because the function you're approximating is not Galilean invariant. So the resulting truncation error in the method is not Galilean invariant. By studying slip surfaces, that is, surfaces that have a discontinuous change in the uh, velocity and a discontinuous change in the density, then there's no scale in the problem. There's no minimum scale. The fastest growing modes are going to be at the grid scale because that's the dispersion relation for the cage instability. And the solution is unresolved. And so it's going to be strongly affected by the truncation error at the grid scale. But the truncation error is not Galilean invariant, so the solution is not going to be Galilean invariant. By boosting the solution to different velocities, by adding this constant velocity, you're affecting the truncation error, so you're going to affect the solution. But because the solution is unresolved, you could have done exactly the same thing just by changing the resolution. In other words, to see this effect, you didn't need to boost the frames of reference. That's one way of affecting the truncation error. You could have just run the calculation with different resolutions because obviously that's another way to affect the truncation error. So what happens when you do exactly the same problem but you keep it at rest? You know, run in a series of simulations in a frame of reference which, which is at rest and you do uh, different resolutions, well, there's 25 squared and 100 squared and 400 squared. The solutions are qualitatively different. And the issue is which one is correct? You know, in other words, if I were to say I want to have my code reproduce, a, be Galilean invariant, I want it to reproduce a solution in any arbitrary frame so it's the same as the solution in a stationary frame, well, which stationary frame should I choose? Which one of these stationary frames is the correct solution that I'm supposed to reproduce? Uh, I mean, there is none because it's not a resolved solution. And you can see that you, just by looking at this plot right here, you, you know that what boosting has done is increased the truncation error because it's diffused this out. And, and by reducing the, the resolution, you've increased the in truncation error and you're sort of producing the same smoothing out. Okay, that's all well and good. So the important question, however, is are grid codes Galilean invariant for resolved solutions? Suppose I did a problem where all the unstable wavelengths were resolved, and I boosted that to a high velocity frame, what would I get there? Well, let's study the cage instability across a resolved shear layer, not a discontinuity anymore, not a slip surface. It has a hyperbolic tanch profile with some characteristic thickness A. A is just some parameter. I make A big enough so that with my grid resolution, I can resolve that interface. And then I add a resolved perturbation, twice the wavelength just of the box, just like before, and I boost it to different frames using a constant velocity 100 times. Let's just not go for 10. Let's go for 100 times the sound speed. This is Mach 100. This is a tough test you are taking. I mean, I hope, you know, normally you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't try to solve KH in a Mach 100 frame of reference compared to the background flow. So, so what happens? 
Well, here's the perturbed x velocity. That is the x velocity minus the constant background velocity. And here's the y velocity for both the solution at rest and the solution at Mach 100. Uh, at the peak of the growth of the KH instability, time 4.64. So these are not small perturbations. These are plus or minus half the sound speed. So you've got very large, you know, nearly transonic velocities in this perturbed flow. And the issue is which one is at moving and which one is at rest. You know, any guesses? They're, obviously, these solutions are exactly the same. They're, they're, there's no difference. Uh, that one is at Mach 100, and that one is at rest. So, so we've reproduced Galilean invariance. I've got the same solution for a resolved cage instability, at both in a frame of reference at rest and a frame of reference moving at Mach 100. I can be more quantitative. I can, I can look at the time evolution, time versus log of the y component of kinetic energy, or the kinetic energy and the y component of velocity. We know from linear theory that this should show an exponential growth during the linear regime and then saturate at some nonlinear value. So here's a plot of the uh, log of the transverse kinetic energy versus time. Uh, the solid line is Mach 100. The dashed line is Mach 0. Yes, there are two lines there. Yes, I was very careful to make sure I used two different files, so I know they're not the same plot. By the way, you have no idea how hard it was for me to make this plot here, because I kept forgetting which one was which, so I couldn't remember which one to put where. Uh, but th these differ by only the third and fourth digits in the uh, actual files. Question in the back. Can you just give me a test? Um, I guess this case doesn't have uh, a magnetic field, right? This does not have a magnetic field, no. Can you just give me a test? I haven't done the magnetic field case, but once again, if you do a magnetic field which has a current sheet in it and is unresolved, you're going to get Galilean invariance. If you do a magnetic field which has a resolved shear layer in it or a resolved current sheet, I would expect the same kind of answer. So well, let me, let me, let me sort of, well, go ahead, sorry. Right. My prediction would be yes, but I haven't done the test. Let me show you one other aspect of this calculation which might help. But the, my bottom line is here is that the, the cage instability has been collect, correctly captured in both of these frames remarkably well. I would say that this solution is Galilean variant. The code's Galilean variant. It's returned exactly the same solution in two different frames of reference. But if I add a discontinuous color variable, which has evolved at exactly the same time with the same code for the same problem, uh, that is diffused in the moving frame. What is, that is to say, color is a passive contaminant. It's evolved according to some conservation law, a continuity equation for color C here, basically. I evolved this equation along with the rest of the dynamical equations for that exactly same problem I just did before. And the initial condition is that the color is discontinuous across the shear layer. So where the velocity is positive, it's one value. Where it's negative, it's the other. So it's not a resolved uh, layer here. It's a discontinuous layer. And in the V equals 0 frame at time 4.64, you get the KH cat's eye. That's what you expected to see for KH instability. But notice in the moving frame, it's not. It's smeared out. It's very similar, very reminiscent of the original KH tests with the density discontinuity. How do you ever get colors other than red or black? By mixing at the grid scale. Exactly right. You hit the, you've nailed it, right? I mean, there is mixing at the grid scale, which is what's caused you know, this to be smeared out. And that mixing at the grid scale is all by truncation error, because it's a discontinuity. So there's lots of mixing across the, the, the uh, red and black at the grid scale due to truncation error. That's what's made all this. Uh, so for this variable, this is Galilean invariant. Even though the, the problem wasn't Galilean, I showed you we got exactly the same answer for the KH instability, exactly the correct linear growth rates, exactly the same nonlinear saturation. This same variable does show Galilean invariance because it's affected more strongly by truncation error. But you knew that anyways, right? Because if I just did the same problem in the stationary frame with this color variable, and I changed the resolution. I didn't bother to boost the frame. I just changed the resolution. You know what's going to happen, right? You're going to get different answers. So once again, what is the right answer for this variable? Well, I don't know, because it's not resolved. And I got a different answer even in the stationary frame, depending on which, which, which uh, 
uh, you know, which resolution I looked at. So, so it's all consistent. You know, variables which are unresolved and dominated by truncation error are Galilean invariant, are not Galilean invariant because their truncation error of grid codes is not Galilean invariant, but quantities that are resolved and dynamics which is resolved is Galilean invariant. So here's the moral of the story, in my humble opinion, M -I -uh, I -M -H -O. I mean, I, I guess some of this may be a bit subjective, so I put this in as being my opinion, and this is maybe an interesting area for, for future discussion. You see, I think boosting the solution to a new reference frame using a uniform velocity is just another way to affect the truncation error. There's lots of ways to do it, but boosting the solution is certainly one of them. And if you're studying solutions that are unresolved, which are dominated by truncation error to begin with, they're going to be Galilean invariant. However, resolved solutions uh, are Galilean invariant modern grid codes. And I just showed you that. The KH instability is a Galilean invariant with a grid code. Maybe the dirty little secret here, though, not, now that we've got the, the laundry hanging out, all the dirty laundry hanging out on the line, you might as well know it all. You know it all is that much of what people currently study with grid codes is probably unresolved, especially if it's involving contact discontinuities, because I can't see how a grid code cannot uh, evolve a contact without being dominated by truncation error at the, at the grid scale. So whenever you're looking at problems with contacts in them, they're probably going to be unresolved, unless you've added surface tension or viscosity or mass diffusion, something to make that interface resolved. And the corollary is that these Eulerian grid codes are, are not good for studying contacts in multiphase media because they have this truncation error, which is Galilean invariant, and those tr now those, those uh, interfaces are going to be affected by that. Special algorithms are going to be needed to handle, I mean, they are needed. I mean, people have implemented these before, so-called interface tracking methods. They're quite popular in engineering to keep track of multiphase media. They, they reduce the uh, truncation error to contacts. Or moving mesh codes, and I, I think that Vocker's new code is an example of this. It's going to have wonderful examples. My prediction is that Vocker's code is going to have a big impact on problems involving contacts like supernova and multi-phase ISM, and because it's going to be great at reducing dissipation at contacts uh, in moving media. And, and this is going to be an exciting area to see how these kind of methods develop. And there's lots of work to be done in developing better methods for handling contacts. So I'm, I'm done here. Uh, I hope to have convinced you that these MHD Godinov methods are mature now. You can have a very uh, nice algorithm for MHD Godinov methods. Uh, I described the various kinds of them and, and one implementation in Athena. They're, they're great codes, they're great algorithms, I should say, great algorithms for studying basic fluid dynamical processes like shocks and instabilities. They're not good for every application. No code is, code is and uh, they're, they're really good for my kind of application domains where I'm really more interested in basic MHD, but maybe not yours. So you need to think about your application domain and what method is really best suited. And then finally, uh, I hope to convince you that grid codes are Galilean invariant as long as you're studying solutions that are not really determined by the truncation error at unresolved interfaces. And I'm done for today. Happy to answer questions, or I will see you Wednesday. <laughs>